Chapter 18. Ricardo's Miscellanea. John Barton. Part A. Gross and Net Income. Net income, as opposed to gross income, which is equal to the total product, or the value of the total product, is the form in which the physiocrats originally conceived surplus value. They consider rent to be its sole form, since they think of industrial profit as merely a kind of wage. Later economists, who blur the concept of profit by calling it wages for the superintendence of labor, ought to agree with them. Net revenue is therefore in fact the excess of the product, or the excess of its value, over that part of it, which replaces the capital outlay, comprising both constant and variable capital. It thus consists simply of profit and rent. The latter in turn is only a separate portion of the profit, a portion accruing to a class other than the capitalist class. The direct purpose of capitalist production is not the production of commodities, but of surplus value, or profit, in its developed form. The aim is not the product, but the surplus product. Labor itself, from this standpoint, is only productive insofar as it creates profit, or surplus product, for capital. If the worker does not create profit, his labor is unproductive. The mass of productive labor employed is only of interest to capital insofar as through it, or in proportion to it, the mass of surplus labor grows. Only to this extent is what we call necessary labor time necessary. Insofar as it does not have this result, it is superfluous and to be suppressed. It is the constant aim of capitalist production to produce a maximum of surplus value or surplus product with the minimum of capital outlay and to the extent that this result is not achieved by overworking the workers, it is a tendency of capital to seek to produce a given product with the least possible expenditure, economy of power and expense. It is, therefore, the economic tendency of capital which teaches humanity to husband its strength and to achieve its productive aim with the least possible expenditure of means. In this conception, the workers themselves appear as that which they are in capitalist production, mere means of production, not an end in themselves, and not the aim of production. Net income is not determined by the value of the total product, but by the excess of the value of the total product over the value of the capital outlay, or by the size of the surplus product in relation to the total product. Provided this surplus grows, the aim of capitalist production has been achieved, even if the value decreases, or if along with the value, the total quantity of the product also decreases. Ricardo expressed these tendencies consistently and ruthlessly, hence much howling against him on the part of the philanthropic Philistines. In considering net income, Ricardo again commits the error of resolving the total product into revenue, wages, profits, and rent, and disregarding the constant capital which has to be replaced, but we will leave this out of account here. On Chapter 32, Mr. Malthus's Opinions on Rent it is of importance to distinguish clearly between gross revenue and net revenue, for it is from the net revenue of a society that all taxes must be paid. Suppose that all the commodities in the country, all the corn, raw produce, manufactured goods, etc., which could be brought to market in the course of the year, were of the value of 20 millions, and that in order to obtain this value, the labor of a certain number of men was necessary, and that the absolute necessaries of these laborers required an expenditure of 10 millions. I should say that the gross revenue of such society was 20 millions, and its net revenue 10 millions. It does not follow from this supposition that the laborers should only receive 10 millions for their labor. They might receive 12, 14, or 15 millions, and in that case, they would have 2, 4, or 5 millions of the net income. The rest would be divided between landlords and capitalists, but the whole net income would not exceed 10 millions. Suppose such a society paid 2 millions in taxes, its net income would be reduced to 8 millions. And in chapter 26, Ricardo says, What would be the advantage resulting to a country from a great quantity of productive labor if, whether it employed that quantity or a smaller, its net rent and profits together would be the same? The whole produce of the land and labor of every country is divided into three portions. Of these, one portion is devoted to wages, another to profits, and the other to rent. This is wrong, because the portion devoted to replacing the capital, wages excluded, employed in production has been forgotten. It is from the last two portions only that any deductions can be made for taxes or for saving, the former, if moderate, constituting always the necessary expenses of production. Ricardo himself makes the following comment on this passage in a note on page 416. Perhaps this is expressed too strongly, as more is generally allotted to the laborer under the name of wages than the absolutely necessary expenses of production. In that case, a part of the net produce of the country is received by the laborer and may be saved or expended by him or it may enable him to contribute to the defense of the country, 
To an individual with a capital of 20,000 pounds, whose profits were 2,000 per annum, it would be a matter quite indifferent whether his capital would employ a hundred or a thousand men, whether the commodity produced sold for 10,000 pounds or for 20,000 pounds, provided, in all cases, his profits were not diminished below 2,000. Is not the real interest of the nation similar? Provided its net real income, its rent and profits be the same, it is of no importance whether the nation consists of 10 or of 12 millions of inhabitants. Its power of supporting fleets and armies and all species of unproductive labor must be in proportion to its net and not in proportion to its gross income. If 5 millions of men could produce as much food and clothing as was necessary for 10 millions, food and clothing for 5 millions would be the net revenue. Would it be of any advantage to the country that to produce this same net revenue, seven millions of men should be required? That is to say, seven millions should be employed to produce food and clothing sufficient for twelve millions. The food and clothing of five millions would be still the net revenue. The employing a greater number of men would enable us neither to add a man to our army and navy, nor to contribute one guinea more in taxes. To gain a better understanding of Ricardo's views, the following passages must also be considered. There is this advantage always resulting from a relatively low price of corn, that the division of the actual production is more likely to increase the fund for the maintenance of labor, inasmuch as more will be allotted, under the name of profit, to the productive class, and less under the name of rent to the unproductive class. Productive class here refers only to the industrial capitalists. Rent is a creation of value, but not a creation of wealth. If the price of corn, from the difficulty of producing any portion of it, should rise from four pounds to five per quarter, a million quarters will be of the value of five million pounds instead of four million. The society altogether will be possessed of a greater value, and in that sense, rent is a creation of value. But this value is so far nominal that it adds nothing to the wealth, that is to say the necessaries, conveniences, and enjoyments of the society. We should have precisely the same quantity and no more of commodities and the same million quarters of corn as before, but the effect of its being rated at five pounds per quarter instead of four would be to transfer a portion of the value of the corn and commodities from their former possessors to the landlords. Rent, then, is a creation of value, but not a creation of wealth. It adds nothing to the resources of a country. Supposing that through the import of foreign corn, the price of corn falls so that rent is decreased by one million. Ricardo says that as a result, the money incomes of the capitalists will increase, and then continues, but it may be said that the capitalist income will not be increased, that the million deducted from the landlord's rent will be paid in additional wages to laborers. Be it so, the situation of the society will be improved, and they can bear the same money burdens with a greater facility than before. It will only prove what is still more desirable, that the situation of another class, and by far the most important class in society, is the one which is chiefly benefited by the new distribution. All that they receive, more than nine millions, forms part of the net income of the country, and it cannot be expended without adding to its revenue, its happiness, or its power. Distribute, then, the net income as you please. Give a little more to one class and a little less to another, yet you do not thereby diminish it. A greater amount of commodities will be still produced with the same labor, although the amount of the gross money value of such commodities will be diminished. But the net money income of the country, that fund from which taxes are paid and enjoyments procured, would be much more adequate than before to maintain the actual population, to afford it enjoyments and luxuries, and to support any given amount of taxation. Part B. Machinery. Ricardo and Barton on the influence of machines on the conditions of the working class. Section 1. Ricardo's Views Subsection A. Ricardo's Original Surmise Regarding the Displacement of Sections of the Workers by Machines From Chapter 1, Section 5, On Value Suppose a machine which could in any particular trade be employed to do the work of 100 men for a year, and that it would only last for one year. Suppose, too, the machine to cost £5,000, and the wages annually paid to 100 men to be £5,000. It is evident that it would be a matter of indifference to the manufacturer whether he bought the machine or employed the men. But suppose labor to rise, and consequently, the wages of 100 men for a year amounted to £5,500. It is obvious that the manufacturer would now no longer hesitate. It would be for his interest to buy the machine and get his work done for 5000 But will not the machine rise in price? Will not that also be worth 5500 in consequence of the rise of labor? 
it would rise in price if there were no stock employed on its construction and no profits to be paid to the maker of it. If, for example, the machine were the produce of the labor of 100 men, working one year upon it with the wages of 50 pounds each, and its price were consequently 5,000 pounds, should those wages rise to 55 pounds, its price would be 5,500. But this cannot be the case. Less than 100 men are employed, or it could not be sold for 5,000. For out of the 5,000 pounds must be paid the profits of stock which employed the men. Suppose, then, that only 85 men were employed at an expense of 50 pounds each, or 4,250 per annum, and that the 750 pounds which the sale of the machine would produce over and above the wages advanced to the men constituted the profits of the engineer's stock. When wages rose 10%, he would be obliged to employ an additional capital of 425 pounds and would therefore employ 4,675 pounds instead of 4,250 on which capital he would only get a profit of 325 pounds if he continued to sell his machine for 5,000. But this is precisely the case of all manufacturers and capitalists. The rise of wages affects them all. If, therefore, the maker of the machine should raise the price of it in consequence of a rise of wages, an unusual quantity of capital would be employed in the construction of such machines, till their price afforded only the common rate of profits. We see, then, that machines would not rise in price in consequence of a rise of wages. The manufacturer, however, who in a general rise of wages can have recourse to a machine which shall not increase the charge of production on his commodity, would enjoy peculiar advantages if he could continue to charge the same price for his goods. But he, as we have already seen, would be obliged to lower the price of his commodities, or capital would flow to his trade until his profits had sunk to the general level. Thus, then, is the public benefited by machinery. These mute agents are always the produce of much less labor than that which they displace even when they are of the same money value. This point is quite right. At the same time, it provides the answer to those who believe that the workers displaced by machines find employment in machine manufacture itself. This view, incidentally, belongs to an epoch in which the engineering workshop was still based entirely on the division of labor, and machines were not as yet employed on the production of machines. Suppose the annual wage of one man to be 50 pounds, and that of 100 is 5,000. If these 100 men are replaced by a machine which costs similarly 5,000 pounds, then this machine must be the product of the labor of less than 100 men. For besides paid labor, it contains unpaid labor, which forms the profit of the machine manufacturer. If it were the product of 100 men, then it would contain only paid labor. If the rate of profit were 10%, then approximately 4,545 pounds of the 5,000 would represent the capital advanced, and approximately 455 pounds the profit. At a wage of 50 pounds, 4,545 would only represent 90 and 9 tenths men. But the capital of 4,545 by no means represents only variable capital, that is, capital laid out in wages. It represents also raw materials and the wear and tear of the fixed capital employed by the machine manufacturer. The machine costing 5,000 pounds, which replaces 100 men whose wages come to 5,000 pounds, thus represents the product of far fewer than 90 men. Moreover, the machine can only be employed profitably if it is the product of far fewer men than it replaces. Every rise in wages increases the variable capital that has to be laid out, although the value of the product, since this is equal to the variable capital plus the surplus labor, remains the same, for the number of workers which the variable capital sets in motion remains the same. Subsection B Ricardo on the influence of improvements in production on the value of commodities. False theory of the availability of the wages fund for the workers who have been dismissed. On Chapter 20, Value and Riches, Their Distinctive Properties. Natural agents add nothing to the value of commodities. On the contrary, they reduce it. But by doing so, they add to the surplus value, which alone interests the capitalists. In contradiction to the opinion of Adam Smith, Mr. Say, in the fourth chapter, speaks of the value which is given to commodities by natural agents, such as the sun, the air, the pressure of the atmosphere, etc., which are sometimes substituted for the labor of man, and sometimes concur with him in producing. But these natural agents, though they add greatly to the value in use, never add exchangeable value, of which Mr. Say is speaking. As soon as, by the aid of machinery, or by the knowledge of natural philosophy, you oblige natural agents to do the work which was before done by man, the exchangeable value of such work falls accordingly, 
The machine costs labor. Natural agents as such cost nothing. They cannot, therefore, add any value to the product. Rather, they diminish its value insofar as they replace capital or labor, immediate or accumulated labor. Inasmuch as natural philosophy, that is science, teaches how to replace human labor by natural agents without the aid of machinery or only with the same machinery as before, perhaps even more cheaply as with the steam boiler, many chemical processes, etc., it costs the capitalist and society as well nothing and cheapens commodities absolutely. Ricardo continues the above quoted passage thus. If ten men turned a corn mill, and it be discovered that by the assistance of wind or of water, the labor of these ten men may be spared, the flour which is the produce partly of the work performed by the mill would immediately fall in value in proportion to the quantity of labor saved, and the society would be richer by the commodities which the labor of the ten men could produce, the funds destined for their maintenance being in no degree impaired. Society would in the first place be richer by the diminished price of flour. It would either consume more flour or spend the money formerly destined for flour upon some other commodity, either existing or called into life because a new fund for consumption had become available. Of this part of the revenue, formerly spent on flour, and now, consequent upon the diminished price of flour, set free for some other application, it may be said that it was destined, by virtue of the whole economy of the society, for a certain thing, and that it is now freed from that destiny. It is the same as if new capital had been accumulated, and in this way, the application of machinery and natural agents frees capital and enables previously latent needs to be satisfied. On the other hand, it is wrong to speak of the funds destined for the maintenance of the ten men thrown out of employment by the new discovery. For the first fund which is saved or created through the discovery is that part of the revenue which society previously paid for flour and which it now saves as a result of the diminished price of flour. The second fund which is saved, however, is that which the miller previously paid for the ten men now displaced. This fund, indeed, as Ricardo notes, is in no degree impaired by the discovery and the displacement of the ten men. But the fund has no natural connection with the ten men. They may become paupers, starve, etc. One thing only is certain, that ten men of the new generation who should take the place of these ten men in order to turn the mill must now be absorbed in other employment and so the relative population has increased, independently of the average increase of population, in that the mill is now driven by a natural agent, and the ten men who would otherwise have had to turn it are employed in producing some other commodity. The invention of machinery and the employment of natural agents thus set free capital and men, that is workers, and create together with freed capital, freed hands, free hands as Stuart calls them, whether for newly created spheres of production or for the old ones which are expanded and operated on a larger scale. The miller, with his freed capital, will build new mills, or will lend out his capital if he cannot use it himself as a capitalist. On no account, however, is there a fund destined for the ten men displaced. We shall return to this absurd assumption, namely, that if the introduction of machines or natural agents does not reduce the quantity of means of subsistence which can be laid out in wages, the fund which has thus been set free must necessarily be expended as variable capital as if there was no possibility of exporting means of subsistence, or spending them on unproductive workers, or as if wages in certain spheres could not rise, etc., and must even be paid out to the displaced laborers. Machinery always creates a relative surplus population, a reserve army of workers, which greatly increases the power of capital. In the note on page 335, Ricardo also makes the following observation directed against Say. Though Adam Smith, who defined riches to consist in the abundance of necessaries, convenience, and enjoyments of human life, would have allowed that machines and natural agents might very greatly add to the riches of a country, he would not have allowed that they add anything to the value of those riches. Natural agents indeed add nothing to value, so long as there are no circumstances in which they give occasion for the creation of rent. But machines invariably add their own value to the already existing value, and firstly, insofar as their existence facilitates the further transformation of circulating into fixed capital and makes it possible to carry on this transformation on an ever-growing scale, they increase not only wealth, but also the value which is added by past labor to the product of the annual labor. Secondly, since machines make possible the absolute growth of population, and with it the growth of the mass of annual labor, they increase the value of the annual product in this second way. Subsection C. Ricardo's scientific honesty, which led him to revise his views on the question of machinery. Certain false assumptions are retained in Ricardo's new formulation of the question, 
on Chapter 31 on Machinery. This section, which Ricardo added to his third edition, bears witness to his honesty, which so essentially distinguishes him from the vulgar economists. It is more incumbent on me to declare my opinions on this question, that is, the influence of machinery on the interests of the different classes of society, because they have, on further reflection, undergone a considerable change, and although I am not aware that I have ever published anything respecting machinery which it is necessary for me to retract, yet I have in other ways, as a member of Parliament, given my support to doctrines which I now think erroneous. It therefore becomes a duty in me to submit my present views to examination, with my reasons for entertaining them. Ever since I first turned my attention to questions of political economy, I have been of opinion that such an application of machinery to any branch of production as should have the effect of saving labor was a general good, accompanied only with that portion of inconvenience which in most cases attends the removal of capital and labor from one employment to another. This inconvenience is great enough for the worker if, as in modern production, it is perpetual. It appeared to me that provided the landlords had the same money rents, they would be benefited by the reduction in prices of some of the commodities on which those rents were expended, and which reduction of price could not fail to be the consequence of the employment of machinery. The capitalist, I thought, was eventually benefited precisely in the same manner. He indeed, who made the discovery of the machine, or who first usefully applied it, would enjoy an additional advantage by making great profits for a time. But in proportion as the machine came into general use, the price of the commodity produced would, from the effects of competition, sink to its cost of production, when the capitalist would get the same money profits as before, and he would only participate in the general advantage as a consumer by being enabled, with the same money revenue, to command an additional quantity of comforts and enjoyments. The class of laborers also, I thought, was equally benefited by the use of machinery, as they would have the means of buying more commodities with the same money wages, and I thought that no reduction of wages would take place, because the capitalist would have the power of demanding and employing the same quantity of labor as before, although he might be under the necessity of employing it in the production of a new, or at any rate, of a different commodity. If by improved machinery, with the employment of the same quantity of labor, the quantity of stockings could be quadrupled, and the demand for stockings were only doubled, some laborers would necessarily be discharged from the stocking trade. But as the capital which employed them was still in being, and as it was the interest of those who had it to employ it productively, it appeared to me that it would be employed on the production of some other commodity, useful to the society, for which there could not fail to be a demand. As then, it appeared to me that there would be the same demand for labor as before, and that wages would be no lower, I thought that the laboring class would, equally with the other classes, participate in the advantage from the general cheapness of commodities arising from the use of machinery. These were my opinions, and they continue unaltered as far as regards the landlord and the capitalist, but I am convinced that the substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the class of laborers. In the first place, Ricardo starts from the false assumption that machinery is always introduced into spheres of production in which the capitalist mode of production already exists. But the mechanized loom originally replaced the hand loom weaver, the spinning jenny the hand spinner, the mowing, threshing, and sewing machines often the small peasant, who himself cultivated his plot of land, etc. In this case, not only is the laborer displaced, but his instrument of production too ceases to be capital, in the Ricardian sense. This entire or complete devaluation of the old capital also takes place when machinery revolutionizes manufacture previously based on the simple division of labor, it is ridiculous to say in this case that the old capital continues to make the same demand for labor as before. The capital, which was employed by the handloom weaver, hand spinner, etc., has ceased to exist. But suppose for the sake of simplicity that the machinery is introduced only in the spheres where capitalist production is already dominant, or it may be introduced into the workshop already based on machinery, thus increasing the mechanization of the labor processes, or bringing into use improved machinery, which makes it possible either to dismiss a section of the workers previously employed, or to produce a greater product while employing the same number of workers as before. The latter is of course the most favorable case. In order to reduce confusion, we must distinguish here between firstly, the funds of the capitalist who employs machinery and dismisses workers, and secondly, the funds of society, that is, of the consumers of the commodities produced by this capitalist. Regarding number one, so far as the capitalist who introduces the machinery is concerned, it is wrong and absurd to say that he can lay out the same amount of capital in wages as before. Even if he borrows, it is still equally wrong not for him but for society. One part of his capital he will convert into machinery and other forms of fixed capital, 
another part into auxiliary materials which he did not need before, and a larger part into raw materials, if we assume that he produces more commodities with fewer workers, thus requiring more raw material. The proportion of variable capital, that is to say, of capital laid out in wages to constant capital, has decreased in his branch of business, and this reduction in the proportion will be permanent. Indeed, the decrease in variable capital relatively to constant will even continue at a faster rate as a result of the productive power of labor developing along with accumulation. Even if his business, on the new scale of production, expands to such an extent that he can re-employ the total number of dismissed workers and employ even more workers than before, the demand for labor in his business will grow with the accumulation of capital, but to a much smaller degree than his capital accumulates, and his capital will in absolute terms never again require the same amount of labor as before. The immediate result, however, will be that a section of the workers is thrown onto the street, but it may be said that indirectly the demand for workers will remain the same, for more workers will be required for the construction of machines. But Ricardo himself has already shown that machinery never costs as much labor as the labor which it displaces. It is possible for the hours of labor in the machine workshops to be lengthened for some time, and that in the first instance not a man more may be employed in them. Raw material, cotton for example, can come from America and China, and it makes no difference whatsoever to the Englishman who has been thrown out of work whether the demand for Negroes or coolies grows. But even assuming that the raw materials are supplied within the country, more women and children will be employed in agriculture, more horses, etc., and perhaps more of one product and less of another will be produced. But there will be no demand for the dismissed workers, for in agriculture too, the same process which creates a constant relative surplus population is taking place. At first glance, it is not likely that the introduction of machinery will set free any of the capital of the manufacturer when he makes his first investment. It merely provides a new type of investment for his capital. Its immediate result, according to the assumption, is the dismissal of workers and the conversion of part of the variable capital into constant capital. Regarding number two, so far as the general public is concerned, in the first place, revenue is set free as a result of the lowering in the price of the commodity produced by means of the machine. Capital, directly, only insofar as the manufactured article enters into constant capital as an element of production. If it entered into the average consumption of the worker, it would, according to Ricardo, bring in its wake a reduction in real wages, also in the other branches of industry. A part of the revenue thus set free will be consumed in the same article either because the reduction in price makes it accessible to new classes of consumers, in this case, incidentally, it is not displaced revenue that is expended on the article, or because the old consumers consume more of the cheaper article, for instance, four pairs of cotton stockings instead of one pair. Another part of the revenue thus set free may serve to expand the industry into which the machinery has been introduced, or it may be used in the formation of a new industry producing a different commodity, or it may serve to expand a sphere of production which already existed before. For whatever purpose the revenue thus set free and reconverted into capital is used, it will in the first place hardly be sufficient to absorb that part of the increased population which each year streams into each branch of production, and which is now debarred from entering the old industry. It is, however, also possible for a portion of the freed revenue to be exchanged against foreign products or to be consumed by unproductive workers, but by no means does a necessary connection exist between the revenue that has been set free and the workers that have been set free of revenue. The absurd fundamental notion, however, which underlies Ricardo's view, is the following. The capital of the manufacturer who introduces machinery is not set free. It is merely utilized in a different manner, namely in such a manner that it is not, as before, transformed into wages for the workers who are discharged. A part of the variable capital is converted into constant capital. Even if some of it were set free, it would be absorbed by spheres in which the discharged laborers could not work, and where at the most those who replace them could find refuge. By expanding old spheres of production, or opening up new ones, the revenue set free, insofar as it is not offset by greater consumption of the cheaper article, or is not exchanged against foreign means of subsistence, only gives the necessary opening, if it does so, for that part of the annual population increase that is for the time being debarred from the old trade into which the machinery has been introduced. But the absurdity which lies concealed at the root of Ricardo's notions is this. The means of subsistence, which were previously consumed by the workers now discharged, remain after all in existence and are still on the market. The workers, on the other hand, are also available on the market, 
Thus there are, on the one hand, means of subsistence, and therefore means of payment, for workers, i.e. potential variable capital, and on the other, unemployed workers. Hence, the fund is there to set them in motion. Consequently, they will find employment. Is it possible that even such an economist as Ricardo can babble such hair-raising nonsense? According to this, no human being who is capable of work and willing could ever starve in bourgeois society when there are means of subsistence on the market at the disposal of the society to pay him for any work whatever. These means of subsistence in the first place do not by any means confront those workers as capital. Assume that 100,000 workers have suddenly been thrown out on the streets by machinery. Then in the first place, there is no doubt whatsoever that the agricultural products on the market, which on the average suffice for the whole year and which were previously consumed by these workers, are still on the market as before. If there were no demand for them, and if at the same time they were not exportable, what would happen? As the supply relative to the demand would have grown, they would fall in price, and as a result of this fall in price, their consumption would rise, even if the 100,000 workers were starving to death. The price need not fall. Perhaps less of these means of subsistence is imported, or more of them exported. Ricardo imagines chaotically that the entire bourgeois social mechanism is arranged so nicely that if, for instance, ten men are discharged from their work, the means of subsistence of these workers, now set free, must definitely be consumed in one way or another by the identical ten men, and that otherwise they could not be sold. As if a mass of semi-employed or completely unemployed were not forever crawling around at the bottom of this society, and as if the capital existing in the form of means of subsistence were a fixed amount. If the market price of corn fell due to the increasing demand, then the capital available in the shape of corn would be diminished in terms of money, and would exchange for a smaller portion of the society's money revenue, insofar as it is not exportable. And this applies even more to manufacturers. During the many years in which the handloom weavers were slowly dying of hunger, the production and export of English cotton cloth increased enormously. At the same time, 1838 to 1841, the prices of provisions rose, and the weavers had only rags in which to clothe themselves, and not enough food to keep body and soul together. The constant artificial production of a surplus population, which disappears only in times of feverish prosperity, is one of the necessary conditions of production of modern industry. There is nothing to prevent a part of the money capital lying idle and without employment, and the prices of the means of subsistence falling because of relative surplus production, while at the same time, workers who have been displaced by machinery are starving. It is true that in the long run, the labor that has been released, together with the portion of revenue or capital that has been released, will find an opening in a new sphere of production, or in the expansion of the old one. But this is of more benefit to those who succeed the displaced men than to the displaced men themselves. New ramifications of more or less unproductive branches of labor are continually being formed, and in these, revenue is directly expended. Then there is the formation of fixed capital, railways, etc., and the labor connected with superintendents, which this opens up. The manufacture of luxuries, foreign trade, which increasingly diversifies the articles on which revenue is spent. From his absurd standpoint, Ricardo therefore assumes that the introduction of machinery harms the workers only when it diminishes the gross product, and therefore gross revenue. A case which may occur, it is true, in large-scale agriculture, with the introduction of horses which consume corn in place of the workers, with the transition from corn growing to sheep raising, etc. But it is quite preposterous to extend this case to industry proper, whose ability to sell its gross product is by no means restricted by the internal market. Incidentally, while one section of the workers starves, another section may be better fed and clothed, as may also the unproductive workers, and the middle strata, between worker and capitalist. It is wrong in itself to say that the increase, or the quantity of articles entering into revenue as such, forms a fund for the workers, or forms capital for them. A portion of these articles is consumed by unproductive workers, or non-workers. Another portion may be transformed by means of foreign trade, from its coarse form, the form in which it serves as wages, into a form in which it enters into the revenue of the wealthy, or in which it serves as an element of production of constant capital. Finally, a portion will be consumed by the discharged workers themselves, in the workhouse, or in prison, or as alms, or as stolen goods, or as payment for the prostitution of their daughters. In the following pages, I shall briefly compare the passages in which Ricardo develops this nonsense. As he says himself, he received the impetus for it from Barton's work, which must therefore be examined after citing these passages. It is self-evident that in order to employ a certain number of workers each year, a certain quantity of food and other necessary means of subsistence must be produced annually, 
In large-scale agriculture, stock raising, etc., it is possible for the net income, profit and rent, to be increased while the gross income is reduced. That is to say, while the quantity of necessaries intended for the maintenance of the workers is reduced. But that is not the question here. The quantity of articles entering into consumption, or to use Ricardo's expression, the quantity of articles of which the gross revenue consists, can be increased without a consequent increase in that portion of this quantity which is transformed into variable capital. This may even decrease. In this case, more is consumed as revenue by capitalists, landlords, and their retainers, the unproductive classes, the state, the middle strata, merchants, etc. What lies behind the view taken by Ricardo and Barton is that he originally set out from the assumption that every accumulation of capital is equivalent to an increase in the variable capital, that the demand for labor therefore increases directly in the same proportion as capital is accumulated. But this is wrong, since with the accumulation of capital, a change takes place in its organic composition, and the constant part of the capital grows at a faster rate than the variable. This does not, however, prevent revenue from constantly growing, in value and in quantity but it does not result in a proportionately larger part of the total product being laid out in wages. Those classes and subclasses who do not live directly from their labor become more numerous and live better than before, and the number of unproductive workers increases as well. Since in the first place it has nothing to do with the question, we will not concern ourselves with the revenue of the capitalist who transforms a part of his variable capital into machinery, and who therefore also puts more into raw material relatively to the amount of labor employed in all those spheres of production where raw material is an element of the process of creating value. His revenue, and that part of his capital which has actually gone into the production process, exist, at first, in the form of products, or rather commodities, which he produces himself, for example yarn if he is a spinner. After the introduction of machinery, he transforms one part of these commodities, or the money for which he sells them, into machinery, auxiliary materials, and raw materials, whereas previously he paid it out as wages to the workers, thus transforming it indirectly into means of subsistence for the workers. With some exceptions in agriculture, he will produce more of these commodities than before, although his discharged workers have ceased to consume, and therefore to buy his own articles, though they did so before. More of these commodities will now be present on the market, although for the workers thrown out on the street, they have ceased to exist as objects of consumption, or have ceased to exist in their previous quantity. Thus, so far as his own product is concerned, in the first place, even if it enters into the consumption of the workers, its increased production in no way contradicts the fact that a part of it has ceased to exist as capital for the workers. A larger part of it, on the other hand, must now replace that portion of the constant capital which resolves into machinery, auxiliary materials, and raw materials. That is to say, it must be exchanged against more of these ingredients of reproduction than formerly. If the increase in commodities through machinery and the decrease in a previously existing demand, namely in the demand of the workers that have been discharged, for the commodities produced by this machinery were contradictory, then in most cases no machinery could in fact be introduced. The mass of commodities produced, and the portion of these commodities which is reconverted into wages therefore, have no definite relationship or necessary connection when we consider the capital of which a part is transformed into machinery instead of into wage labor. So far as society in general is concerned, the replacement of its revenue, or rather the extension of the limits of its revenue, takes place first of all on account of the articles whose price has been lowered by the introduction of machinery. This revenue may continue to be spent as revenue, and if a considerable part of it is transformed into capital, the increased population, apart from the artificially created surplus population, is already there to absorb that part of the revenue, which is transformed into variable capital. At first glance, therefore, what this comes to is only the production of all other articles, particularly in the spheres which produce articles entering into the consumption of the workers, despite the discharging of the hundred men, etc., continues on the same scale as before, quite certainly at the moment when the workers are discharged. In so far, therefore, as the dismissed workers represent a demand for these articles, the demand has decreased, although the supply has remained the same. If the reduced demand is not made good, the price will fall, or instead of a fall in price, a larger stock may remain on the market for the following year. If the article is not produced for export too, and if the decrease in demand were to persist, then reproduction would decrease, but it does not follow that the capital employed in this sphere must necessarily decrease. Perhaps more meat or commercial crops or luxury foods are produced, and less wheat, or more oats for horses, etc., or fewer fustian jackets and more bourgeois frock coats. But none of these consequences need necessarily materialize if, for instance, as a result of the cheapening of cotton goods, the employed workers are able to spend more on food, etc. 
The same quantity of commodities, and even more of them, including those consumed by the workers, can be produced, although less capital, a smaller portion of the total product, is transformed into variable capital, that is, laid out in wages. Neither is it the case that part of the capital of the producers of these articles has been set free. At worst, the demand for their commodities would have decreased, and the reproduction of their capital impeded by the reduced price of their commodities. Hence, their own revenue would immediately decrease, as it would with any fall in the prices of commodities. But it cannot be said that any particular part of their commodities had previously confronted the discharged workers as capital, and was now set free along with the workers. What confronted the workers as capital was a part of the commodity now being produced with machinery. This part came to them in the form of money, and was exchanged by them for other commodities, that is, means of subsistence, which did not face them as capital, but confronted their money as commodities. This is therefore an entirely different relationship. The farmer and any other producer whose commodity they bought with their wages did not confront them as capitalist, and did not employ them as workers. They have only ceased to be buyers for him, which may possibly, if not counterbalanced by other circumstances, bring about a temporary depreciation in his capital, but does not set free any capital for the discharged workers. The capital that employed them is still in being, but no longer in a form in which it resolves into wages, or only indirectly and to a smaller extent. Otherwise, anyone who through some bad luck ceased to have money would inevitably set free sufficient capital for his own employment. Subsection D. Ricardo's correct determination of some of the consequences of the introduction of machines for the working class. Apologetic notions in the Ricardian explanation of the problem. By gross revenue, Ricardo means that part of the product which replaces wages and surplus value, profits and rent. By net revenue, he means the surplus product, which equals the surplus value. He forgets here, as throughout his work, that a portion of the gross product must replace the value of the machinery and raw material, in short, the value of the constant capital. Ricardo's subsequent treatment is of interest, partly because of some of the observations he makes in passing, partly because, mutatis mutandis, it is of practical importance for large-scale agriculture, particularly sheep rearing, and shows the limitations of capitalist production. Not only is its determining purpose not production for the producers, workmen, but its exclusive aim is net revenue, i.e. profit and rent even if this is achieved at the cost of the volume of production, at the cost of the volume of commodities produced. My mistake arose from the supposition that whenever the net income of a society increased, its gross income would also increase. I now, however, see reason to be satisfied that the one fund from which landlords and capitalists derive their revenue may increase while the other, that upon which the laboring class mainly depend, may diminish, and therefore it follows, if I am right, that the same cause which may increase the net revenue of the country may, at the same time, render the population redundant and deteriorate the condition of the laborer. First, it is noteworthy that Ricardo here admits that causes which further the wealth of the capitalists and landlords may render the population redundant, so that redundant population, or overpopulation, is presented here as the result of the process of enrichment itself, and of the development of productive forces which conditions this process. So far as the fund is concerned, out of which the capitalists and landlords draw their revenue, and on the other hand the fund from which the workers draw theirs, to begin with, it is the total product which forms this common fund. A large part of the products which enter into the consumption of the capitalists and landlords does not enter into the consumption of the workers. On the other hand, almost all, in fact more or less all, products which enter into the consumption of the workers also enter into that of the landlords and capitalists, their retainers and hangers-on, including dogs and cats. One cannot suppose that there are two essentially distinct fixed funds in existence. The important point is what relative portion each of these groups draws from the common fund. The aim of capitalist production is to obtain as large an amount of surplus product or surplus value as possible with a given amount of wealth. This aim is achieved by constant capital growing more rapidly in proportion to variable capital, or by setting in motion the greatest possible constant capital with the least possible variable capital. In much more general terms than Ricardo conceives here, the same cause effects an increase in the fund out of which capitalists and landlords draw their revenue by a decrease in the fund out of which the workers draw theirs. It does not follow from this that the fund from which the workers draw their revenue is diminished absolutely, only that it is diminished relatively, in proportion to their total output. And that is the only important factor in the determination of the portion which they appropriate out of the wealth which they themselves created. <laughs>
a capitalist, we will suppose, employs a capital of the value of 20,000 pounds, and that he carries on the joint business of a farmer and a manufacturer of necessaries. We will further suppose that 7,000 pounds of this capital is invested in fixed capital, that is, in buildings, implements, etc., and that the remaining 13,000 pounds is employed as circulating capital in the support of labor. Let us suppose, too, that profits are 10%, and consequently, that the capitalist capital is every year put into its original state of efficiency and yields a profit of 2,000 pounds. Each year, the capitalist begins his operations by having food and necessaries in his possession of the value of 13,000 pounds, all of which he sells in the course of the year to his own workmen for that sum of money, and during the same period, he pays them the like amount of money for wages. At the end of the year, they replace in his possession food and necessaries to the value of 15,000 pounds, 2,000 of which he consumes himself or disposes of as may best suit his pleasure and gratification. The nature of surplus value is very palpably expressed here. As far as these products are concerned, the gross produce for that year is 15,000 pounds and the net produce 2,000. Suppose now that the following year the capitalist employs half his men in constructing a machine and the other half in producing food and necessaries as usual. During that year, he would pay the sum of 13,000 pounds in wages as usual and would sell food and necessaries to the same amount to his workmen. But what would be the case the following year? While the machine was being made, only one half of the usual quantity of food and necessaries would be obtained, and they would be only one half the value of the quantity which was produced before. The machine would be worth 7,500 pounds, and the food and necessaries 7,500, and therefore the capital of the capitalist would be as great as before, for he would have besides these two values his fixed capital worth 7,000 pounds, making in whole 20,000 pounds capital and 2,000 pounds profit. After deducting this latter sum for his own expenses, he would have a no greater circulating capital than 5,500 pounds, with which to carry on his subsequent operations, and therefore his means of employing labor would be reduced in the proportion of 13,000 to 5,500, and consequently all the labor which was before employed by 7,500 would now become redundant. This would, however, also be the case if by means of the machine which costs him 7,500, exactly the same quantity of products were produced as previously with the variable capital of 13,000. Suppose the wear and tear of the machine were equal to one-tenth in one year, that is, to 750 pounds, then the value of the product, previously 15,000 pounds, would now be 8,250, apart from the wear and tear of the original fixed capital of 7,000 pounds, whose replacement Ricardo does not mention at all. Of these 8,250, 2,000 would be profit, as previously out of the 15,000. The lower price would be advantageous to the farmer, insofar as he himself consumes food and necessaries as revenue. It would also be advantageous to him, insofar as it enables him to reduce the wages of the workers he employs, thus releasing a portion of his variable capital. It is this portion, which to a certain degree could employ new labor, but only because the real wage of the workers who have been retained had fallen. A small number of those who have been discharged could thus, at the cost of those who had been retained, be re-employed. The fact, however, that the product would be just as great as before would not help the dismissed workers. If the wage remained the same, no part of the variable capital would be released. The fact that the product of 8,250 pounds represents the same amount of necessaries in food as previously 15,000 pounds does not cause its value to rise. The farmer would have to sell it for 8,250 partly in order to replace the wear and tear of his machinery, and partly in order to replace his variable capital. Insofar as this lowering of the price of food and necessaries did not bring about a fall in wages in general, or a fall in the ingredients entering into the reproduction of the constant capital, the revenue of the society would have expanded only insofar as it is expended on food and necessaries. A section of the workers, etc., would live better, that is all. They could also save, but that is always action in the future. The discharged workers would remain on the street, although the physical possibility of their maintenance existed just as much as before. Moreover, the same capital would be employed in the reproduction process as before, but a part of the product whose value had fallen, which previously existed as capital, now becomes revenue. The reduced quantity of labor which the capitalist can employ must indeed, with the assistance of the machine and after deductions for its repairs, produce a value equal to 7,500 pounds, it must replace the circulating capital with the profit of £2,000 on the whole capital. But if this be done, if the net income be not diminished, of what importance is it to the capitalist whether the gross income be of the value 3000 10000 or 15000 This is perfectly correct. The gross income is of absolutely no importance to the capitalist, 
the only thing which is of interest to him is the net income. In this case, then, although the net produce will not be diminished in value, although its power of purchasing commodities may be greatly increased, the gross produce will have fallen from a value of 15,000 pounds to a value of 7,500, and as the power of supporting a population and employing labor depends always on the gross produce of a nation and not on its net produce. Hence Adam Smith's partiality for gross produce, a partiality to which Ricardo objects. See chapter 26 on gross and net revenue, which Ricardo opens with the words, quote, Adam Smith constantly magnifies the advantages which a country derives from a large gross rather than a large net income, end quote. There will necessarily be a diminution in the demand for labor, population will become redundant, and the situation of the laboring classes will be that of distress and poverty. Labor, therefore, becomes redundant because the demand for labor diminishes, and that demand diminishes in consequence of the development of the productive powers of labor. As, however, the power of saving from revenue to add to capital must depend on the efficiency of the net revenue to satisfy the wants of the capitalist, it could not fail to follow from the reduction in the price of commodities consequent on the introduction of machinery that with the same wants, but his wants grow larger, he would have increased means of saving increased facility of transferring revenue into capital. According to this, first one part of capital is transformed into revenue, transferred to revenue, not in terms of value, but as regards the use value, the material elements of which the capital consists, in order later to transfer a part of the revenue back into capital. For example, when £13,000 was laid out in variable capital, a part of the product amounting to 7500 entered into the consumption of the workers whom the farmer employed, and this part of the product formed part of his capital. Following upon the introduction of machinery, for example, according to our supposition, the same amount of product is produced as previously, but its value does not amount to 15,000 pounds as previously, but only to 8,250, and a larger part of this cheaper product enters into the revenue of the farmer, or the revenue of the buyers of food and necessaries. They now consume a part of the product as revenue, which was previously consumed industrially, as capital, by the farmer, although his laborers, since dismissed, consumed it as revenue as well. As a result of this growth in revenue, which has come about because a part of the product which was previously consumed as capital is now consumed as revenue, new capital is formed and revenue is reconverted into capital. But with every increase of capital, he would employ more laborers. This, in any case, not in proportion to the increased capital, not to the whole extent of that increase. Perhaps he would buy more horses or guano or new implements. And therefore, a portion of the people thrown out of work in the first instance would be subsequently employed, and if the increased production, in consequence of the employment of the machine, was so great as to afford in the shape of net produce as great a quantity of food and necessaries as existed before in the form of gross produce, there would be the same ability to employ the whole population, and therefore there would not necessarily, but possibly and probably, be any redundancy of people. In the last lines, Ricardo thus says what I observed above. In order that revenue is transformed in this way into capital, capital is first transformed into revenue. Or, as Ricardo puts it, first the net produce is increased at the expense of the gross produce in order then to reconvert a part of the net produce into gross produce. Produce is produce. Net or gross makes no difference, although this antithesis may also mean that the excess over and above the outlay increases, that therefore the net produce grows although the total product, i.e. the gross produce, diminishes. The produce only becomes net or gross according to the determinate form which it assumes in the process of production. All I wish to prove is that the discovery and use of machinery may be attended with a diminution of gross produce, and whenever that is the case, it will be injurious to the laboring class, as some of their number will be thrown out of employment, and population will become redundant compared with the funds which are to employ it. But the same may, and in most instances will be the case, even if the gross produce remains the same or increases, but that part of it which was formerly used as variable capital is now consumed as revenue. It is superfluous for us to go into Ricardo's absurd example of the clothier who reduces his production because of the introduction of machinery. If these views be correct, it follows, firstly, that the discovery and useful application of machinery always leads to the increase of the net produce of the country, although it may not, and will not, after a considerable interval, increase the value of that net produce. It will always increase that value whenever it diminishes the value of labor. Secondly, that an increase of the net produce of a country is compatible with a diminution of the gross produce, 
and that the motives for employing machinery are always sufficient to ensure its employment if it will increase the net produce, although it may and frequently must diminish both the quantity of the gross produce and its value. Thirdly, that the opinion entertained by the laboring class that the employment of machinery is frequently detrimental to their interests is not founded on prejudice and error, but is conformable to the correct principles of political economy. Fourthly, that if the improved means of production, in consequence of the use of machinery, should increase the net produce of a country in a degree so great as not to diminish the gross produce, I mean always quantity of commodities and not value, then the situation of all classes will be improved. The landlord and capitalist will benefit, not by an increase of rent and profit, but by the advantages resulting from the expenditure of the same rent and profit on commodities, very considerably reduced in value. This sentence contradicts the whole of Ricardo's doctrine, according to which the lowering in the price of necessaries, and therefore of wages, raises profits, whereas machinery, which permits more to be extracted from the same land with less labor, must lower rent. While the situation of the laboring classes will also be considerably improved. First, from an increased demand for menial servants, this is indeed a fine result of machinery, that a considerable section of the female and male laboring class is turned into servants. Secondly, from the stimulus to savings from revenue, which such an abundant net produce will afford. And thirdly, from the low price of all articles of consumption on which their wages will be expended. And in consequence of this low price, their wages will be reduced. The entire apologetic bourgeois presentation of machinery does not deny, firstly, that machinery, sometimes here, sometimes there, but continually, makes a part of the population redundant, throws a section of the laboring population on the street, it creates a surplus population, thus leading to lower wages in certain spheres of production, here or there, not because the population grows more rapidly than the means of subsistence, but because the rapid growth in the means of subsistence, due to machinery, enables more machinery to be introduced, and therefore reduces the immediate demand for labor. This comes about not because the social fund diminishes, but because of the growth of this fund, the part of it which is spent in wages falls relatively. Secondly. Even less do these apologetics deny the subjugation of the workers who operate the machines and the wretchedness of the manual workers or craftsmen who are displaced by machinery and perish. What they assert, and partly rightly, is firstly that due to machinery and the development of the productivity of labor in general, the net revenue, that is profit and rent, grows to such an extent that the bourgeois needs more menial servants than before, whereas previously he had to lay out more of his product in productive labor, he can now lay out more in unproductive labor so that servants and other workers living in the unproductive class increase in number. This progressive transformation of a section of the workers into servants is a fine prospect. For the worker, it is equally consoling that because of the growth in the net product, more spheres are opened up for unproductive workers, who live on his product, and whose interest in his exploitation coincides more or less with that of the directly exploiting classes. Secondly, that because of the spur given to accumulation, on the new basis requiring less living labor in proportion to past labor, the workers who were dismissed and pauperized, or at least that part of the population which replaces them, are either absorbed in the expanding engineering works themselves, or in branches of production which machinery has made necessary and brought into being, or in new fields of employment opened by the new capital and satisfying new wants. This, then, is another wonderful prospect. The laboring class has to bear all the temporary inconveniences, unemployment, displacement of labor and capital, but wage labor is nevertheless not to be abolished. On the contrary, it will be reproduced on an ever-growing scale, growing absolutely, even though decreasing relatively to the growing total capital which employs it. Thirdly, the consumption becomes more refined due to machinery. The reduced price of the immediate necessities of life allows the scope of luxury production to be extended. Thus the third fine prospect opens before the workers. In order to win their means of subsistence, the same amount of them as before, the same number of laborers, will enable the higher classes to extend, refine, and diversify the circle of their enjoyments, and thus to widen the economic, social, and political gulf separating them from their betters. Fine prospects these for the laborer, and very desirable results of the development of the productive powers of his labor. Furthermore, Ricardo then shows that it is in the interest of the laboring classes that as much of the revenue as possible should be diverted from expenditure on luxuries to be expended in support of menial servants. For whether I purchase furniture or keep menial servants, I thereby present a demand for a definite amount of commodities, and set in motion approximately the same amount of productive labor in one case as in the other, 
but in the latter case, I add, to the former demand for laborers, and this addition would take place only because I chose this mode of expending my revenue. The same applies to the maintenance of large fleets and armies. Whether the revenue was expended in the one way or in the other, there would be the same quantity of labor employed in production, for the food and clothing of the soldier and sailor would require the same amount of industry to produce it as the more luxurious commodities. But in the case of the war, there would be the additional demand for men as soldiers and sailors, and consequently, a war which is supported out of the revenue and not from the capital of a country is favorable to the increase of population. There is one other case that should be noticed, of the possibility of an increase in the amount of the net revenue of a country, and even of its gross revenue, with a diminution of demand for labor, and that is, when the labor of horses is substituted for that of man. If I employed 100 men on my farm, and if I found that the food bestowed on 50 of those men could be diverted to the support of horses, and afford me a greater return of raw produce, after allowing for the interest of the capital which the purchase of the horses would absorb, it would be advantageous to me to substitute the horses for the men and I should accordingly do so. But this would not be for the interest of the men, and unless the income I obtained was so much increased as to enable me to employ the men as well as the horses, it is evident that the population would become redundant, and the laborer's condition would sink in the general scale. It is evident he could not, under any circumstances, be employed in agriculture. Why not, if the field of agriculture were enlarged? But if the produce of the land were increased by the substitution of horses for men, he might be employed in manufactures or as a menial servant. There are two tendencies which constantly cut across one another. Firstly, to employ as little labor as possible in order to produce the same or a greater quantity of commodities, in order to produce the same or a greater net produce, surplus value, net revenue. Secondly, to employ the largest possible number of workers, although as few as possible in proportion to the quantity of commodities produced by them, because, at a given level of productivity, the mass of surplus value and of surplus product grows with the amount of labor employed. The one tendency throws the laborers onto the streets and makes a part of the population redundant. The other absorbs them again and extends wage slavery absolutely, so that the lot of the worker is always fluctuating, but he never escapes from it. The worker, therefore, justifiably regards the development of the productive power of his own labor as hostile to himself. The capitalist, on the other hand, always treats him as an element to be eliminated from production. These are the contradictions with which Ricardo struggles in this chapter. What he forgets to emphasize is the constantly growing number of the middle classes, those who stand between the workmen on the one hand and the capitalist and landlord on the other. The middle classes maintain themselves to an ever-increasing extent directly out of revenue. They are a burden weighing heavily on the working base and increase the social security and power of the upper 10,000. According to the bourgeoisie, the perpetuation of wage slavery through the application of machinery is a vindication of the latter. I have before observed, too, that the increase of net incomes estimated in commodities, which is always the consequence of improved machinery, will lead to new savings and accumulations. These savings, it must be remembered, are annual and must soon create a fund, much greater than the gross revenue originally lost by the discovery of the machine, when the demand for labor will be as great as before and the situation of the people will be still further improved by the increased savings, which the increased net revenue will still enable them to make. First, gross revenue declines and net revenue increases. Then, a portion of the increased net revenue is transformed into capital again, and hence into gross revenue. Thus, the workmen must constantly enlarge the power of capital, and then, after very serious disturbances, obtain permission to repeat the process on a larger scale. With every increase of capital and population, food will generally rise, on account of its being more difficult to produce. It then goes straight on. The consequence of a rise of food will be a rise of wages, and every rise of wages will have a tendency to determine the saved capital in a greater proportion than before to the employment of machinery. Machinery and labor are in constant competition, and the former can frequently not be employed until labor rises. The machine is thus a means to prevent a rise of labor. To elucidate the principle, I have been supposing that improved machinery is suddenly discovered and extensively used, but the truth is that these discoveries are gradual and rather operate in determining the employment of the capital which is saved and accumulated than in diverting capital from its actual employment. The truth is that it is not so much the displaced labor as rather the new supply of labor, the part of the growing population which was to replace it, for which, as a result of new accumulation, new fields of employment are opened. In America and many other countries, where the food of man is easily provided, 
there is not nearly such great temptation to employ machinery. Nowhere is it used on such a massive scale, and also, so to speak, for domestic needs, as in America. As in England, where food is high and costs much labor for its production. How little the employment of machinery is dependent on the price of food is shown precisely by America, which employs relatively much more machinery than England, where there is always a redundant population. The use of machinery may, however, depend on the relative scarcity of labor, as, for instance, in America, where a comparatively small population is spread over immense tracts of land. Thus we read in The Standard of September 19, 1862, in an article on the exhibition, Man is a machine-making animal. If we consider the American as a representative man, the definition is perfect. It is one of the cardinal points of an American system to do nothing with his hands that he can do by machine. From rocking a cradle to making a coffin, from milking a cow to clearing a forest, from sewing on a button to voting for president almost, he had a machine for everything. He has invented a machine for saving the trouble of masticating food. The exceeding scarcity of labor and its consequent high value, despite the low value of food, as well as a certain innate cuteness have stimulated this inventive spirit. The machines produced in America are, generally speaking, inferior in value to those made in England. They are rather, as a whole, makeshifts to save labor than interventions to accomplish former impossibilities. And the steamships? At the exhibition in the United States Department is Emery's Cotton Gin. For many a year after the introduction of cotton to America, the crop was very small, because not only was the demand rather limited, but the difficulty of cleaning the crop by manual labor rendered it anything but remunerative. When Eli Whitney, however, invented the saw cotton gin, there was an immediate increase in the breadth planted, and that increase has up to the present time gone on almost in an arithmetical progression. In fact, it is not too much to say that Whitney made the cotton trade. With modifications more or less important and useful, his gin has remained in use ever since, and until the invention of the present improvement in addition, Whitney's original gin was quite as good as the most of its would-be supplanters. By the present machine, which bears the name of Messrs. Emery of Albany, New York, we have no doubt that Whitney's gin, on which it is based, will be almost entirely supplanted. It is simple and more efficacious. It delivers the cotton not only cleaner, but in sheets like wadding, and thus the layers as they leave the machine are at once fit for the cotton press and the bale. In the American court proper, there is little else than machinery, the cow milker, a belt shifter, a hemp carding and spinning machine, which at one operation reels the clover direct from the bale. Machines for the manufacture of paper bags, which it cuts from the sheet, pastes, folds, and perfects at the rate of 300 a minute. Hawes clothes wringer, which by two India rubber rollers, presses from clothes the water, leaving them almost dry, saves time, but does not injure the texture. Bookbinders machinery, machines for making shoes. It is well known that the uppers have been for a long time made by machinery in this country. But here are machines for putting on the sole, others for cutting the sole to shape, and others again for trimming the heels. A stone-breaking machine is very powerful and ingenious, and no doubt will come extensively into use for ballasting roads and crushing ores. A system of marine signals by Mr. W. H. Ward of Auburn, New York. Reaping and mowing machines are an American invention coming into very general favor in England. McCormick's machine is the best. Hansbro's California prize metal force pump is in simplicity and efficiency the best in exhibition. It will throw away more water with the same power than any pump in the world. Quote from Ricardo, The same cause that raises labor does not raise the value of machines, and therefore, with every augmentation of capital, a greater proportion of it is employed on machinery. The demand for labor will continue to increase with an increase of capital, but not in proportion to its increase. The ratio will necessarily be a diminishing ratio. In this last sentence, Ricardo expresses the correct law of the growth of capital, although his reasoning is very one-sided. He adds a note to this, from which it is evident that he follows Barton here, whose work we will therefore examine briefly. But first, one more comment. When Ricardo discussed revenue expended either on medial servants or luxuries, he wrote, In both cases, the net revenue would be the same, and so would be the gross revenue, but the former would be realized in different commodities. Similarly, the gross produce, in terms of value, may be the same, but it may be realized, and this would strongly affect the workmen, in different commodities, according to whether it had to replace more variable or constant capital. Section 2. Barton's Views Subsection A. Barton's thesis that accumulation of capital causes a relative decrease in the demand for labor. <laughs> 
Barton's and Ricardo's lack of understanding of the interconnection between this phenomenon and the domination of capital over labor. Barton's work is called Observations on the Circumstances Which Influence the Condition of the Laboring Classes of Society. Let us first gather together the small number of theoretical propositions to be found in Barton's work. Quote, the demand for labor depends on the increasing of circulating and not of fixed capital. Were it true that the proportion between these two sorts of capital is the same at all times and in all countries, then indeed it follows that the number of laborers employed is in proportion to the wealth of the state. But such a position has not the semblance of probability. As arts are cultivated and civilization is extended, fixed capital bears a larger and larger proportion to circulating capital. The amount of fixed capital employed in the production of a piece of British muslin is at least a hundred, probably a thousand times greater than that employed in the production of a similar piece of Indian muslin. And the proportion of circulating capital employed is a hundred or a thousand times less. It is easy to conceive that under certain circumstances, the whole of the annual savings of an industrious people might be added to fixed capital, in which case they would have no effect in increasing the demand for labor. Ricardo comments on this passage in a note on page 480 of his work. It is not easy, I think, to conceive that under any circumstances, an increase of capital should not be followed by an increased demand for labor. The most that can be said is that the demand will be in a diminishing ratio. Mr. Barton, in the above publication, has, I think, taken a correct view of some of the effects of an increasing amount of fixed capital on the conditions of the laboring classes. His essay contains much valuable information. To Barton's above proposition, we must add the following one. Fixed capital, when once formed, ceases to affect the demand for labor. Incorrect, since it necessitates reproduction, even if only at intervals and gradually. But during its formation, it gives employment to just as many hands as an equal amount would employ either of circulating capital or of revenue. The demand for labor depends absolutely on the joint amount of revenue and circulating capital. Indisputably, Barton has very great merit. Adam Smith believes that the demand for labor grows in direct proportion to capital accumulation. Malthus derives surplus population from capital not being accumulated as rapidly as the population. Barton was the first to point out that the different organic component parts of capital do not grow evenly with accumulation and development of the productive forces, that on the contrary, in the process of this growth, that part of capital which resolves itself into wages decreases in proportion to the other, he calls it fixed capital, which, in relation to its size, alters the demand for labor only to a very small degree. He is therefore the first to put forward the important proposition that the number of laborers employed is not in proportion to the wealth of the state, that relatively more workers are employed in an industrially undeveloped country than in one which is industrially developed. In the third edition of his Principles, on chapter 31 on machinery, Ricardo, having followed exactly in Smith's footsteps in his earlier editions, now takes up Barton's correction on this point, and moreover, in the same one-sided formulation in which Barton gives it. The only point in which he makes an advance, and this is important, is that unlike Barton, he not only says that the demand for labor does not grow proportionally with the development of machinery, but that the machines themselves render the population redundant, see page 469 i.e. create surplus population. But he wrongly limits this effect to the case in which the net produce is increased at the cost of the gross produce. This only occurs in agriculture, but he also transfers it into industry. Essentially, however, the whole of the absurd theory of population was thus overthrown, in particular also the claptrap of the vulgar economists, that the workers must strive to keep their multiplication below the standard of the accumulation of capital. The opposite follows from Barton's and Ricardo's presentation. Namely, that to keep down the laboring population, thus diminishing the supply of labor and consequently raising its price, would only accelerate the application of machinery, the conversion of circulating into fixed capital, and hence make the population artificially redundant. Redundancy exists generally, not in regard to the quantity of the means of subsistence, but the means of employment, the actual demand for labor. Barton's error or deficiency lies in his conceiving the organic differentiation or composition of capital only in the form in which it appears in the circulation process, as fixed and circulating capital, a difference which the physiocrats had already discovered, which Adam Smith had developed further, and which became a prepossession among the economists who succeeded him. A prepossession insofar as they see only this difference, which was handed down to them, in the organic composition of capital, 
This difference, which arises out of the process of circulation, has a considerable effect on the reproduction of wealth in general, and therefore also on that part of it which forms the wages fund. But that is not decisive here. The difference between fixed capital, such as machinery, buildings, breeding cattle, etc., and circulating capital does not directly lie in their relation to wages, but in their mode of circulation and reproduction. The direct relation of the different component parts of capital to living labor is not connected with the phenomena of the circulation process. It does not arise from the latter, but from the immediate process of production, and its expression is the relation of constant to variable capital, whose difference is based only on their relationship to living labor. Thus Barton says, for example, the demand for labor does not depend on fixed capital, but only on circulating capital. But a part of circulating capital, raw material and auxiliary materials, is not exchanged against living labor any more than is machinery. In all branches of industry, in which raw material enters as an element into the process of the creation of value, insofar as we consider only that portion of the fixed capital which enters into the commodity, it forms the most important part of that portion of capital which is not laid out in wages. Another part of the circulating capital, namely of the commodity capital, consists of articles of consumption, which enter into the revenue of the non-productive class, i.e. not of the working class. The growth of these two parts of circulating capital, therefore, does not influence the demand for labor any more than does that of fixed capital. Furthermore, the part of the circulating capital which resolves itself into raw materials and auxiliary materials increases in the same or even greater proportion as that part of capital which is fixed in machinery, etc., on the basis of the distinction made by Barton, Ramsey goes further. He improves on Barton but retains his method of approach. Indeed, he reduces the distinction to constant and variable capital, but continues to call constant capital fixed capital, although he includes raw materials, etc., and calls variable capital circulating capital, although he excludes from it all circulating capital which is not directly laid out in wages. More on this later when we come to Ramsey. It does, however, show the intrinsic necessity of the progress. Once the distinction between constant capital and variable capital has been grasped, a distinction which arises simply out of the immediate process of production, out of the relationship of the different component parts of capital to living labor, it also becomes evident that in itself it has nothing to do with the absolute amount of the consumption goods produced, although plenty with the way in which these are realized. The way, however, of realizing the gross revenue in different commodities is not, as Ricardo has it, and Barton intimates it, the cause, but the effect of the imminent laws of capitalistic production, leading to a diminishing proportion, compared with the total amount of produce, of that part of it which forms the fund for the reproduction of the laboring class. If a large part of the capital consists of machinery, raw materials, auxiliary materials, etc., then a smaller portion of the working class as a whole will be employed in the reproduction of the means of subsistence, which enter into the consumption of the workers. This relative diminution in the reproduction of variable capital, however, is not the reason for the relative decrease in the demand for labor, but on the contrary, its effect. Similarly, a larger section of the workers employed in the production of articles of consumption, which enter into revenue in general, will produce articles of consumption that are consumed by, or exchanged against the revenue of, capitalists, landlords and their retainers, the state, the church, etc. And a smaller section will produce articles destined for the revenue of the workers. But this again is effect, not cause. A change in the social relations of workers and capitalists, a revolution in the conditions governing capitalist production, would change this at once. The revenue would be realized in different commodities, to use an expression of Ricardo's. There is nothing in the, so to speak, physical conditions of production which forces the above to take place. The workmen, if they were dominant, if they were allowed to produce for themselves, would very soon, and without great exertion, bring the capital, to use a phrase of the vulgar economists, up to the standard of their needs. The very great difference is whether the available means of production confront the workers as capital and can therefore be employed by them only insofar as it is necessary for the increased production of surplus value and surplus produce for their employers, in other words, whether the means of production employ the workers, or whether the workers, as subjects, employ the means of production, in the accusative case, in order to produce wealth for themselves. It is of course assumed here that capitalist production has already developed the productive forces of labor in general to a sufficiently high level for this revolution to take place. Take, for example, 1862, the plight of the Lancashire unemployed laborers. On the other hand, the difficulty of finding employment for money on the London money market. This has almost made necessary the formation of fraudulent companies, since it is difficult to obtain 2% for money. 
According to Ricardo's theory, some new field of employment ought to have been opened up, for on the one hand there is capital in London, and on the other, unemployed workers in Manchester. Subsection B. Barton's views on the movement of wages and the growth of population. Barton explains further that the accumulation of capital increases the demand for labor only very slowly, unless the population has grown to such an extent previously that the rate of wages is low. The portion which the wages of labor at any particular time bear to the whole produce of labor determine the appropriation of capital in one way as fixed capital or the other as circulating capital. For if the rate of wages should decline, while the price of goods remain the same, or if goods should rise while wages remain the same, the profit of the employer would increase, and he would be induced to hire more hands. If, on the other hand, wages should rise in proportion to commodities, the master would keep as few hands as possible. He would aim at performing everything by machinery. We have good evidence that population advanced much more slowly under a gradual rise of wages during the earlier part of the last century than during the latter part of the same century while the real price of labor fell rapidly. A rise of wages of itself, then, never increases the laboring population. A fall of wages may sometimes increase it very rapidly. Suppose that the Englishman's demands should sink to the level of the Irishman's. Then the manufacturer would engage more workers in proportion to the diminished expense of maintenance. It is the difficulty of finding employment, much more than the insufficiency of the rate of wages, which discourages marriage. It is admitted that every increase of wealth has a tendency to create a fresh demand for labor, but as labor, of all commodities, requires the greatest length of time for its production. For the same reason, the rate of wages can remain below the average for long periods, because of all commodities, labor is the most difficult to withdraw from the market, and thus to bring down to the level of the actual demand. So of all commodities, it is the most raised by a given increase of demand. And as every rise of wages produces a tenfold reduction of profits, it is evident that the accumulation of capital can operate only in an inconsiderable degree in adding to the effectual demand for labor, unless preceded by such an increase of population as shall have the effect of keeping down the rate of wages. Barton puts forward various propositions here. First, it is not the rise of wages in itself which increases the laboring population, but a fall in wages may very easily and rapidly make it rise. Proof, the first half of the 18th century, gradual rise in wages, slow movement in population. In the second half of the 18th century, on the other hand, sharp fall in real wages, rapid increase in the laboring population. Reason, it is not the insufficient rate of wages which prevents marriages, but the difficulty of finding employment. Secondly, the facility of finding employment stands, however, in inverse ratio to the rate of wages. For capital is transformed into circulating or fixed capital, that is to say, capital which employs labor or capital which does not employ it, in inverse proportion to the high or low level of wages. If wages are low, the demand for labor is great, because it is then profitable for the employer to use much labor, and he can employ more with the same circulating capital. If wages are high, then the manufacturer employs as few workers as possible, and seeks to do everything with the aid of machines. Thirdly, the accumulation of capital by itself raises the demand for labor only slowly, because each increase in this demand, if labor is scarce, causes the wages of labor to rise rapidly and brings about a fall of profit which is ten times greater than the rise in wages. Accumulation can have a rapid effect on the demand for labor only if accumulation was preceded by a large increase in the laboring population, and wages are therefore very low so that even a rise of wages still leaves them low because the demand mainly absorbs unemployed workers rather than competing for those fully employed. This is all, with a grain of salt, correct, so far as fully developed capitalist production is concerned. But it does not explain this development itself. And even Barton's historical proof, therefore, contradicts that which it is supposed to prove. During the first half of the 18th century, wages rose gradually, the population grew slowly, and there was no machinery. Moreover, compared with the following half of the century, little other fixed capital was employed. During the second half of the 18th century, however, wages fell continuously, population grew amazingly, and so did machinery. But it was precisely the machinery which on the one hand made the existing population superfluous, thus reducing wages, and on the other hand, as a result of the rapid development of the world market, absorbed the population again, made it redundant once more, and then absorbed it again, while at the same time it sped up the accumulation of capital to an extraordinary extent, and increased the amount of variable capital although variable capital fell relatively, both compared with the total value of the product and also compared with the number of workers it employed.
In the first half of the 18th century, however, large-scale industry did not as yet exist, but only manufacture based on the division of labor. The principal component part of capital was still variable capital laid out in wages. The productivity of labor developed slowly compared with the second half of the century. The demand for labor, and therefore also wages, rose almost proportionately to the accumulation of capital. England was as yet essentially an agricultural nation, and a very extensive cottage industry, spinning and weaving, which was carried on by the agricultural population, continued to exist, and even to expand. A numerous proletariat could not as yet come into being, any more than there could exist industrial millionaires at that time. In the first half of the 18th century, variable capital was relatively dominant. In the second, fixed capital. But the latter requires a large mass of human material. Its introduction on a large scale must be preceded by an increase of population. The whole course of things, however, contradicts Barton's presentation, inasmuch as it is evident that a general change in the method of production took place. The laws which correspond to large-scale industry are not identical with those corresponding to manufacture. The latter constitutes merely a phase of development leading to the former. But in this context, some of Barton's historical data, comparing the development in England during the first half and the second half of the 18th century, are of interest, partly because they show the movement of wages and partly because they show the movement in corn prices. Wages increased from the middle of the 17th till near the middle of the 18th century, for the price of corn declined within that space of time not less than 35%. The following graphic will show what proportion the wages of husbandry have borne to the price of corn during the last 70 years. From a table of the number of bills for the enclosing of land passed in each session since the Revolution, given in the Lord's Report on the Poor Laws, it appears that in 66 years from 1688 to 1754, that number was 123. In the 69 years from 1754 to 1813, it was 3,315. The progress of cultivation was then about 25 times more rapid during the last period than the former. But during the first 66 years, more and more corn was grown continually for exportation, whereas during the greater part of the last 69 years, we not only consumed all that we had formerly sent abroad, but likewise imported an increasing and at last a very large quantity for our own consumption. The increase of population in the former period, as compared with the latter, was still slower than the progress of cultivation might appear to indicate. In the year 1688, the population of England and Wales was computed by Gregory King from the number of houses at five millions and a half. The population in 1780 is put down by Mr. Malthus at 7.7 .7 million. In 92 years then, it had increased 2.2 million, and the succeeding 30 years, it increased something more than 2.7 million. But of the first increase, there is every probability that the far greater part took place from 1750 to 1780. Barton calculates from good sources that the number of inhabitants in 1750 was 5.946 million making an increase since the revolution of 446,000, or 7,200 per annum. At the lowest estimate, then, the progress of population of late years has been ten times more rapid than a century ago, yet it is impossible to believe that the accumulation of capital has been ten times greater. It is not a question of how great a quantity of means of subsistence is produced annually, but how large a portion of living labor enters into the annual production of fixed and circulating capital. This determines the size of the variable capital in relation to the constant. Barton explains the remarkable increase in population, which took place almost all over Europe during the last 50 to 60 years, from the increased productivity of the American mines, since this abundance of precious metals raised commodity prices more than wages, thus in fact lowering the latter and causing the rate of profit to rise. End of Part 2